Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to try to get centered here so you can see me. Um, for those of you who have not been on one of our webinars before, it's an interesting uh, situation where you guys can see me. Uh, you can see the slides, but I can't see you. So if you're making faces and grimacing, I'm not going to be able to read up on that. But uh, as Amanda said, shoot your notes if you have any questions going forward. Uh, we chose diesel fuel quality today for a number of reasons, and I'll walk through that a, as we go through the presentation. Um, it's gaining a lot of traction. I'm going to be honest, I don't have any answers today, but more to the point, what I want to do is really kind of frame the issue and tee up the discussion and kind of indicate uh, the opportunities for collaboration across the sectors to uh, see if we can't find solutions and answers to the issue. So real quick on an overview, um, for those of you who aren't familiar who the board, who the Fuels Institute is, this is a snapshot of our board of advisors. It is a very, we are a collaborative organization. Research we do not advocate, so we have no stake in what happens in the market. Our job is to analyze what's going on in the market as directed by our board and provide some objective analysis to that. And we've been around since February 2013, and I think as this uh, board of advisors slide shows, we're probably one of the most diverse organizations in the transportation sector ranging from the biofuels uh, community to refiners, to automakers, retailers, and a variety of other stakeholders within the fuels and transportation sector. At the very bottom of the slide is a caveat. Um, the work we do is directed by the Board of Advisors. Most of it is peer reviewed by them. When we get into fuel quality, we have another uh, subset of stakeholders who are dealing with diesel fuel quality. The comments today are not on behalf of anybody on the board or anybody for the Fuel Quality Council. They are my comments, my assessment of the market based on the research we've done, conversations we've had, and uh, the perspective that we've gained from working with such a diverse group of stakeholders. But I want to make it quite clear that I don't speak on behalf of any individual entity who's on the board or part of the Fuels Institute operations. So with that disclaimer, um, what we want to do today is start looking at uh, talking about fuel quality, diesel fuel quality, diesel fuel corrosion underground storage tanks, and the impact it's having on the market. And like I said before, I picked this such, this uh, topic because it's gaining a lot more attention. We're seeing a lot more articles being written about fuel quality and corrosion. We're seeing a lot more people get engaged in the topic. And I think it's important to put it in context and provide an overview of what can be done going forward. Um, once we go over the kind of the framework of what's happening in the market, I want to walk through the collaborative approach we're taking to try to identify some solutions and then provide you guys some options of how you can get engaged and try to influence the direction of the discussion, the research, and the analysis being done on the, on the topic. So first of all, we just put it into context. I mean, we know trucking is a big issue. See the uh, bumper stickers all over that without trucks, America stops. According to the American Trucking Associations, almost two-thirds of all the freight tonnage moved in the United States is moved by truck. So that basically means that everything we're buying at the stores it probably came on uh, the back of a truck somewhere. Um, in 2015, trucks moved 450 billion miles. They moved goods across the United States 450 billion miles in one year. It's a huge number of miles, and obviously it takes a lot of fuel. According to EIA, in 2017, we consumed almost 60 billion gallons of ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel. When we start thinking about fuel quality in the diesel market, it is really important to keep in mind that it is very integral that the market works as efficiently as possible because the economy is really dependent upon the sector. And we know that truck usage and miles driven and diesel consumption, they move up and down with economic growth. And as we've been witnessing the growth of the economy in the last several years, we're seeing a much more uh, significant demand on the trucking industry and the diesel market in particular to support that economic growth. And so when we start thinking about how the fuels and the engines are working together and what challenges might be presented to the market, the implications go further than just a truck operator or a fuel provider or fuel distributor. It goes to the broader ec economic uh, motor that drives the United States economy, and that's something we need to really think about and keep in context as we go forward. So let's take a look at what we're looking at. So the heavy-duty market, um, heavy-duty diesel vehicles are expected to grow. According to uh, research we did with Navigant Research a couple years ago, where we did a forecast of market, we're seeing a potential increase in the number of heavy-duty vehicles of 41% from 2016 to 2025. 
that is a significant growth and that's really power because the economy is growing so we know that the market is going to expand that is almost a million more vehicles uh, over a nine ten year period being added to the market so we think about that we start talking about new engine technologies that is an indication of how many new technology equipped vehicles new engine types are coming to the market and that has implications for them for the fuel supply <clears throat> we do know that that projection that Navigant did for us a couple years ago is bearing fruit. According to Ward's intelligence, we've seen class eight trucks in June, 2018, sales were up almost 19% over the prior year. And that was a 13th straight month of year over year sales growth. When we take a look at year to date, class eight truck sales are 30% above the first half of 2017. So we're seeing a significant growth in new engines, new vehicles come to market that have different requirements in terms of how they want to interact with the fuel and how they perform going forward. All that being said, diesel is the primary fuel powering the, the trucking industry. And there's really nothing that's kind of popped up in the last several years that threatens that market dominance. Um, natural gas several years ago started gaining some traction. We're still seeing some growth in the natural gas market, but we're talking the two to 3% market share per, uh, perhaps start getting into heavy duty vehicles, it is almost all diesel. And for the foreseeable future, it is going to remain diesel. Um, so we need to really figure out how to make sure that the diesel fuel being introduced into these vehicles is performing its optimum uh, potential to make sure that the trucks can continue to perform at their optimum potential. Um, it's not a situation like we have a light duty vehicle where the threat of electric vehicles coming in and taking over liquid market share is developing and growing in uh, intensity, there really is no threat. So we need to really focus on how we make sure the diesel market and the diesel engines are doing the best they can. The companion to an increase in number of trucks and miles driven is the demand for diesel fuel. Both are sold for diesel sales are up 21% in the last seven years. Now, as the economy grows, as I mentioned, demand for diesel fuel grows, but we're seeing that growth continue it is not a light duty vehicle market. Only about two to 3% of light duty vehicles on the road are equipped with diesel engines. So we are, we do know that the predominant uh, demand for diesel fuel is in, the, is in the trucking industry and that's what we need to be focused on. That being said, the heavy duty, medium duty uh, vehicle market is not immune to regulatory pressures. We know that we're trying to deal with uh, fuel economy improvement requirements for the light duty sector. We're also dealing with fuel economy improvement for the heavy duty sector. According to ICCT, uh, we're looking at potential increase in fuel efficiency of up to 36% in certain vehicles. That is a, a tremendous increase in efficiency. And if you start thinking about you know, the miles driven or is the money being attributed to the, the industry, gaining efficiency, being able to go a little bit further in each gallon of gas, uh, fuel is as important to the trucking industry as it is in the environmental community and trying to figure out exactly how we get the most out of our vehicles and the most out of our fuel is high priority for everybody. Now, obviously the trucking industry is using a variety of different strategies, just like the light duty vehicle market is using different strategies to gain efficiency. But these numbers are something to keep in the back of our minds. We have to work together to see if we can not gain those efficiency targets to provide more value to the uh, industry and to, pro to provide compliance tools to the regulatory requirements and reduce emissions. That being said, all powertrains are projected to get more efficient. Again, according to Navigant Research and report uh, they helped us with a couple years ago, we're seeing that the diesel vehicle market, the heavy duty and the base forecast, expected to increase efficiency by about 18% by 2025. Now you compare that to the previous slide um, that shows some trucks need to go up 36%. Um, about 18% for a heavy duty diesel vehicle efficiency in a 10 year period is a big jump and it's happening we're seeing the efficiency and it's being done by a variety of different strategies as i mentioned before one of the most popular strategies however is, is causing some issues in the market um, but before i get to that the future demand for diesel is not expected to continue to continue to grow i showed the slide earlier that showed we've had about a 21 percent increase in diesel demand since 2011 according to eia's annual energy outlook it's pretty much flatlined we're going to see a slight growth in the next uh, 
until the end of this year, and then their projection is that demand is going to start petering off. Now, how much of that is because projected slowdown in economic growth? How much is due to efficiency? Don't know. I didn't look into it that deeply. But when we think about ULSD supplied and the demand for ULSD being about level for the next uh, couple decades, we know we're going to have more miles driven. We have more trucks coming to the market. So we can ascribe a lot of that to efficiency. Um, and I think that's uh, something that's been borne out in the regulations we're seeing through. So here's one of the key strategies that's uh, raising a lot of issues in the market, and that is the introduction of high pressure common rail fuel injector systems. Um, these are systems that gain a lot more efficiency. And this chart here I stole from Mansfield um, in a presentation that they presented at the uh, Fuels 2018 conference. You see here that almost every single automaker, uh, engine maker, is bringing these common rail high pressure engines fuel injector systems to market. And if you think that we sold about 401,000 medium heavy duty vehicles in 2016, if you look at the number of uh, vehicles introduced in 2016 that were these high pressure common rail systems, they're about 80% or more of the new vehicles are equipped with these engines and these systems. These systems have increased the pressure at which fuel is introduced to the piston chambers from about 5,000 PSI a couple years ago to more than 40,000 pounds per square inch now. Um, and I've heard rumors that next generation systems could eclipse 60,000 PSI in terms of the pressure going into there. That introduces a lot of complexity and a lot of sensitivities. Um, the injector tips are about one micron in diameter. Now, I wrote an article uh, earlier this month that kind of said, think about this. If the, micron, if the injector tip is one micron, any deposit in the fuel greater than one micron can, can clog that injector tip. And if a deposit gets through the injector tip, it's being an introduced into the engine at 40,000 PSI. That's like shooting a bullet into the, the piston chamber. And that can cause a lot of damage. So making sure that the fuel is uh, the best quality possible is important for the, uh, the longevity of these engines and the efficiency of these engines. Um, these systems do yield efficient improvements. They reduce NOx, they reduce PM reductions. But because of those pressures and those uh, tolerance uh, of particle uh, size, they have increased the need for a cleaner fuel and a better fuel than what engines have been able to tolerate in the past, which is raising a lot of issues. And so we think about where we are on fuel, we start taking a look at standards. And the concern about engine compatibility with the fuel being introduced has raised people to start talking about, we need to change diesel specifications. This is a chart one of our Fuel Quality Council members put together for us last year. Just summarizing, you take a look at the ASTM standard for diesel fuel compared to the European standard for diesel fuel, and then the Worldwide Fuel Charter. And the Worldwide Fuel Charter basically represents what the engine manufacturers want from their fuel. And I've just circled those three standards. One thing I want to point out is look at the third row down, sediment volume max. This is a item that's been raised by a lot of uh, people who have concerns. The ASTM standard allows 500 parts per million sediment uh, in the fuel compared to European standard, which is 24. And so you start just looking at that, go, okay, so they're different standards. How do they interact with the engines? And what is the quality of the fuel coming out of the refinery compared to what's the quality of the fuel coming out of the nozzle being introduced in the truck? And we're starting to see even more concern when we get to that level in terms of what are we doing with the fuel and how is it interacting with the engines? And here's part of the problem. Um, when you consider a truckload of diesel fuel, there are a variety of contaminants that can be in it and still be on spec. Glycerin, three or four gallons of water, particulate matter in the truck. And so the fuel that's being delivered could meet specification, but maybe it is not as clean as we would expect it to be or as the current engines need it. Now remember, previous engine iterations could tolerate this without a whole lot of problem. The engines were very, very capable of running on product that has some contaminants in it. The newer engines are not as capable. They're a lot more sensitive to these uh, imp impurities in the fuel. And so how do we address that? Is it a distribution logistics problem? Is it a specification change? What are the strategies to do it? Let's take a look at some other issues we have. Because the fuel, um, is going into the engines and we're seeing some contaminants and the way it's being used. These are pictures of failures in systems, in vehicle systems that have been uh, related to fuel quality. You see corrosion, you see uh, gunk, gunk buildup, you see problem and deteriorated fuel filters. 
Okay, so we're starting to see anecdotal evidence where we're having problems with the engines, we're just having problems with devices. We're having problems in tanks too. Um, Detroit Diesel provided this at our meeting in Chicago and they, they talked about can and oxidation stability as problems. I only point this out because if you look at the two bullets at the bottom, you whether a V5 or ULSD fuel being tested, the last line in each of these, the first one, they had to hammer the the uh, piece out of the out of the um, out of the engine and they take a hammer to pound it out. And the other one had you significant force. You're seeing systems of these devices going through the testing cycles, and at the end of them, they're very difficult to pull out. And that has to do with the way the engine is operating with the fuel. I am not an engineer. I don't know the details of this. But if you're having to knock a, a valve or system out of an engine with a hammer, then we have some issues and we've got to pay attention to that. If it is directly related to the characteristics of the fuel, then let's talk about that and let's figure out how to fix that. And that's something we need to do together rather than just pointing fingers. But there are problems being experienced in the market. From the fuel side itself, one of the members of the Fuel Quality Council provided these samples. Um, they pulled a fuel sample from a 10,000 gallon backyard storage tank and this is what it looked like. The fuel was not clear. It did not meet the, the standards they would have expected to see coming out of the fuel. In addition, they cleaned that same tank and they came out of the tank this type of sediment. Now that sample is on a two foot by two foot um, tarp. You see the sediment pulled out of that tank. So we're seeing problems with the fuel in the storage tank. So we're getting product coming out of the storage tank into the vehicle that is being pumped to the dispenser with contaminants in it, with particulates in it, with impurities in it. And the question now comes into, okay, how did it get there? How do we prevent it from getting there? And if we do prevent it from getting there, is the fuel, when it's clean and meeting the specifications that came out of the refinery, does it match what the engines need? This is not saying that there is a fundamental uh, problem or any point where you can say that's the, the source of the problem. At this point, we don't know. What we do know is that this type of contamination and, and impurities in the fuel does not work well in any engine, let alone the new modern engines that are being introduced in such large volumes into the market. Which leads us to another issue we're having in the market. In 2006, the United States started phasing in a very low sulfur fuel, 15 parts per million ultra low sulfur diesel. This represented a 97% reduction in the sulfur content of the fuel. That enabled the engine manufacturers and the vehicle manufacturers to add after treatment emissions devices to control for a variety of things, particulates and NOx. That's a very good thing. It reduced the emissions, helped the environment. The problem is, Almost immediately, we started hearing anecdotal reports that we're seeing some excessive corrosion in underground storage tanks. The diesel that used to be very stable, used to have no real issues in underground storage tanks in terms of being able to maintain it in the systems, was now starting to exhibit signs of excessive and aggressive wear. I heard people say, you know, my automatic tank gauge has been in there six months. I pulled it out, looks like it's been in there 20 years, it's so corroded. I've heard anecdotal reports that they take the the, the caps off of the storage systems, and there's actually stalagmites hanging from the lid of corrosion. So we're seeing these happen, and over the last several years, it's become much more pervasive. In 2016, EPA issued a report where they analyzed a number of stations um, and tanks, and they found that 83% of the tanks they sampled were affected by corrosion. They actually believe that if the marketer, the, the tank operator doesn't see corrosion yet just because they haven't looked hard enough for it. And what retailers and uh, distributors are starting to see is their filters are starting to get clogged with coffee ground like elements. And so there's a lot of theories going on about what could be causing that. Um, CRC, the Coordinating Research Council, is doing another study right now. It's about the sixth study that I've been aware of since we started bringing ULSD to market trying to understand what's causing the contamination, the corrosion and possibly what are some solutions. Here's what we believe. When sulfur is pulled out of the fuel, the sulfur was an agent that killed the bacteria. We believe that the corrosion is being caused by bacterial activity, and now that the, the sulfur is not there, the bacteria is having a field day and being able to eat a lot of stuff. We at the same time introduced other components to the fuel, which is a, has resulted as a food source for this bacteria, and so we're seeing this excessive corrosion. How do we address it? We don't know yet. 
but we are working on it. But it's an issue that's important because it was talking about making sure that the fuel entering the truck is as pure and as clean as possible. At the same time, we're fighting with a corrosion issue in the storage tank situation. We need to fight both elements at the same time. The CRC study is probably the most comprehensive one I've been aware of and is building upon past learnings from previous uh, uh, studies. And hopefully it'll give us more indication of what we can do to head this off, what we can do to prevent it. We do know that a proper maintenance strategy, making sure the water is being kept out of the tanks as much as possible, a regular cleaning ritual to make sure the tanks are being cleaned and maintained properly helps. Does it solve it? No. Does it prevent it? No, but it can mitigate the consequences. That type of maintenance is very important when we start thinking about improving diesel quality. We have seen some efforts to move forward with regulatory or requirement bases that doesn't really serve to fix the problem or provide long-term solutions, but provides band-aids. Efforts to try to change the filter requirements on dispensers would try, are designed to try to prevent particulates from entering the vehicle, but at the same time, it's not addressing the problem. And so the question is, what do we do to systematically address the issue? What do we do to make sure that the engines being brought to market have the fuel they need to perform at the optimum quality? There is no singular solution. It has to be a multi-step process to address not only the fuel production, the fuel quality as it comes out of the refinery, but the fuel quality when it hits the, the, the nozzle as well. The distribution system is complex. Once that fuel leaves the refinery, it goes through several stages of distribution, storage, and transfer. And any part in that distribution process, contaminants and impurities can be introduced. The question becomes, okay, at what stage are we seeing the most challenge with maintaining product integrity, and what practices can be employed at those different parts of the distribution system to mitigate the deterioration of product, to make sure that we are keeping the contaminants and impurities at a bare minimum at every critical control point within the distribution process from the time it leaves the refinery until it gets into the vehicle uh, through the nozzle. There's not one area that is 100% responsible for product quality. Every single stakeholder who, means, who takes possession of that product has to have a responsibility and has to employ best practices to ensure that the product is maintaining its highest quality. Unfortunately, we get into situations like this, the typical market approach is to start pointing fingers. And the first meeting we had of our Fuel Quality Council about a year and a half, almost two years ago now, really I sat there and I watched the discussion and it was apparent to me that there's a lot at stake here and a lot of people with very passionate positions and a desire to find a solution. And the question is, how do we fix it? And so some of the questions, some of the suggestions have been thrown out there are, we need to change AS team specs. Some are advocating the AS team specifications are inadequate for modern engines. We need to fix the AS team specs. Well, others argue it doesn't matter if you fix the AS team specs. If the distribution system is introducing contaminants and impurities, we have to fix that. If you fix the distribution system, the AS team specs are going to be just fine. But the distribution system says, hold on a second, if the AS team specs are not satisfactory for modern engines, there's no way the distribution system is going to raise the bar on the fuel between the refinery and the nozzle. So you have to change AFC and specs in order to have any chance of having an on a product at the end point of distribution that matches what the engines need. Some say, you know what? The engine manufacturers got ahead of the game. They changed their engine designs to operate on a fuel that's not existing in the market today. Consequently, they should change their engine specifications to be optimized for today's fuel. Don't require the fuel system to change specifications because the engines got ahead of the game. And then others say, why should we change specifications similar to the distribution system needs improvement if it's just going to deteriorate in the market? And so you have this circle of suggested, suggest, suggested changes to make improvements with complicating factors that would negate those improvements. And quite frankly, until we get everybody working together on a comprehensive approach to bring fuel quality at a higher priority and make it a priority to deliver the product we need at the nozzle, then we're gonna have this give and take and this stalling debate where we don't reach solutions. 
but we were approached in the Fields Institute a couple years ago to lead an or lead a collaborative effort, and we've called it the Fuel Quality Council. And here you see the members of our steering committee. At the bottom, we also have four other members who are members of our general council. All of these organizations are dedicated to a collaborative approach, to sharing perspectives, sharing information, doing the research and analysis necessary to identify what makes the best sense for the market, what makes the best sense for fuel quality, what makes the best sense for engine performance, and what makes the most economic sense. And it's very important to keep that in mind. What is the overall impact on the market? And then what makes most sense for all stakeholders to get involved in the game? And you'll see, similar to the Fuel, Fuels Institute Board of Advisors, our Fuel Quality Council Steering Committee is fairly diverse. So you've got fuel pr uh, producers, you've got uh, additive producers, engine manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, distributors and retailers, uh, scientists, you've got equipment providers, tank cleaning companies, people who have experience in the diesel fuel market are engaged here to make sure that we're doing the right thing to answer the proper questions. So what are our objectives of Fuel Quality Council? One, to bridge the gaps. Uh, number one opportunity here is to get people in a room together and start sharing experiences to identify commonalities. If you're just screaming at each other at regulatory proceedings, you're never going to reach an agreement. You're never going to reach a path towards solution. So let's get people together put the fingers down and actually start working on a collaborative solution to bring higher quality to the market. You need to quantify the issues. Quite frankly, some of the pictures I showed earlier, I've had some people argue, you know, John, those may have been anecdotal from one engine manufacturer or one region of the country with poor fuel quality. Is that ubiquitous? Are those experiences that we're hearing anecdotal input about are they being replicated in every region, in every type of market, with every type of engine? What is the scope? What is the nature of the, of the challenge we're having in the market? And can we quantify them? And then finally, we need to evaluate options. It really comes down to economics here. Once we start identifying, once we quantify the issue and know what we're dealing with, then we need to evaluate, okay, what are the possible changes? What are the efforts we can do to improve fuel quality? What are the costs of doing those changes versus the costs of doing nothing? And so I've told the council several times, at the end of the day, we might come out with analysis that shows it's going to cost X dollars to make a change to fuel quality, either through production or distribution efficiencies and improvements of product handling versus an X times two or an X minus five cost of fixing the trucks. And if the cost of fixing the trucks and engine and maintaining those is significantly less than the cost of changing the fuel specifications, the market might decide status quo. But we don't have that ROI, we don't have that economic analysis yet to really be able to make informed decisions. And so the Fuel Quality Council has put together a path to try to de develop the empirical data necessary to make more informed decisions. So here's what we're working on right now. First thing is an engine fuel performance survey. We've been working with the council to put together a mechanism by which we can go out and try to quantify the scope, nature, and cost associated with fuel-related engine problems. And I'll deal, uh, get into more details on that in the next slide. <clears throat> so that's number one. Quantify it by actually asking the people who are familiar and in the market what their experiences are, and see if we can't put a price tag associated with these problems. We need to start looking at distribution best practices. If indeed the product deteriorates from the time it leaves the refinery until it gets into the, the nozzle, okay, at what points are we able to employ best practices, and what is the return on investment for doing so? I think it's important that you can argue to every stakeholder, you need to do everything you can to ensure product integrity and product quality. But they're going to ask, what's in it for me? If it's going to cost me you know, another $1,000 per tank load to do that, then what am I getting in return? So we need to try to quantify what that return on investment for doing the best job you can to ensure product quality, what that ROI is, and articulate that to every stakeholder. We need to look at where people are in terms of their thoughts, whether we should change diesel fuel specifications. The positions on spec changes vary widely. And I think it's important to go out there and talk to the stakeholders, ask them, 
are you look are do you think the specifications need to be changed if so what elements of the specification should be updated or changed and why if you think they shouldn't be changed explain why and let's kind of start creating a catalog of stakeholder positions and rationale for those positions in doing so we might go to find commonalities maybe there's areas where everybody can agree on and quick resolution to certain issues can be can be made while we tackle the more daunting issues so let's find out what we can take on immediately and what needs a little more time to work on it and then the final thing here we're going to work on is fuel quality data analysis there's been a lot of discussion about doing a fuel quality sampling program crc has been looking at doing something they're still trying to figure out whether or not it makes sense to do something that type of analysis is very expensive we all know that if you're going to go out there and take product samples run them through a laboratory test to find different uh, fuel properties and characteristics it's going to be expensive what we want to do to start off with before we endeavor and try to raise the money to do that kind of analysis is let's look at the existing data that's out there what data already exists we know there's a ton of fuel quality data in the market some of them may be proprietary some of it may be publicly available we do know that there's no standardization in terms of how the product was sampled from where it was sampled and what characteristics were being tested so we may not be able to compare apples to apples when we collect data from different sources but let's collect as much data as we can that already exists and analyze it see what can it what does it tell us what can we learn from it in terms of the typical quality of product coming out of the nozzle and where does that differ from what we want to see coming out of the nozzle and then we can start isolating our research to find exactly where the product characteristics that are failing to meet our expectations where they may have failed in the system how we might be able to correct that so very robust data analysis process and then we can possibly fine-tune a fuel quality sampling project to get more to the heart of the matter and maybe uh, focus that effort a little more concretely to deliver greater value to the market but the first thing and really this is kind of the backbone of everything we're doing is this engine fuel performance survey and so we started talking about this quite a while ago and the whole idea is if we can get data from the engine manufacturers about the types of warranty claims they're getting that are fuel related combine that with information from fleet operators on what kind of maintenance they're having to do and what situations and issues they're experiencing that are fuel related quantify the extent of those and the cost associated with those and then also get from fuel providers what type of complaints are they getting from their customers about fuel quality bring all that together in one data set now we can start really evaluating the size and scope of this issue now there's a lot of issues with that some of this information is very proprietary so how do you make sure that people are comfortable providing you this data that can be very important to their intellectual property and their competitive positioning so we've done a couple things this is a blind analysis we have contracted with an outside firm called research now ssi they have agreed to field the survey for us and to collect the uh, raw data when uh, entities are willing to provide that to us they are going to sign an nda a non-disclosure agreement with every company that wants to participate so it's a direct relationship to ensure that there's no disclosure proprietary information they are going to go through and scrub the data of all identifiable characteristics so they're going to collect the survey data the uploaded uh, maintenance and uh, log data they're going to go through and make sure to the best of their ability that there is no way to trace that data back to the original source once they have done that they're going to send it off we've contracted with the national renewable energy laboratory to aggregate the information and analyze it and tell us what what's going on in the market only after that analysis is done will the fuels institute and fuel quality council receive the report back after a period of time all the original data and all the original identifiable information will be destroyed and so the whole idea here is to create a framework and a system a process to provide assurances that those in the market can provide us data to help us better understand the scope of the problem help us better formulate an approach to solving the problem without compromising their competitive positioning or the proprietary data 
We think uh, we're very confident this process is going to work. We ran it by the Fuel Quality Council at our meeting about two months ago. They seem very comfortable with it. So we hope to be able to launch this in the next couple of weeks. They are de developing the survey now. And once that's ready, we're going to go to market and re reach out to people to contribute data. It really comes down to the following message. If we don't have data, we cannot identify what to do next. So collecting the information and analyzing it is almost is imperative to finding a solution to the problem. And then the other thing is we're going to host a fuel quality workshop. I'm waiting for final dates. Uh, we're looking at February 2019. We had looked and talked to our, our council about doing it in October, but we realized there is a significant conflict um, with a biotechnology, a biodiesel technology workshop we want to avoid. So we're looking at a couple dates in February here in Washington, D.C. Um, the whole idea of this is to capitalize on what the council was designed to do, help people share information. And I hearken back to the introduction of ultra low sulfur diesel. During that implementation period, about a four year period from rule finalization to implementation, the industry and EPA got together on several occasions had implementation workshops where each part of the supply system came together to share what they were doing, what challenges they were encountering, what they were doing to overcome those challenges, and what the next steps were. That way, everybody stayed abreast of how the market was transitioning. I believe that there's a great value in sharing perspectives. And so I put on the slide here a draft overview and agenda. Let me just kind of share what my perspective on this is. I've shared it with the Fuel Quality Council Steering Committee, and they're, they're supportive of doing this as well. That's why we're going forward with it. Think about a, a flow where we start off with somebody who builds engines. Not, not a lobbyist, not an advocate, somebody who actually designs engines to share with us what is going, what is being put into the engines, what technologies are being used to improve efficiency, and why they may be more sensitive to fuel quality than previous generations. Kind of a 101 on engine design. Then have somebody give us an overview what specification changes they think might be necessary on the diesel spec to enable these engines to be as efficient as possible. That would then lead into a discussion for somebody who builds refineries to give us an idea of what it would take to produce a fuel that matches those specification changes. What is the cost? How long would it take to bring that fuel to market? And what would be the challenges associated with it? That way, we start looking at what the actual production of fuel and the engines and how those all work together from an economic and feasibility standpoint. Have another panel talking about the bio and renewable diesel component. That's a significant component of the fuel supply distribution. Let's learn a little bit more about what their, those industries are doing to ensure product quality as it interacts with the diesel product in the market and is introduced in engines. That's part one. Part one is really, let's look at the engine and fuel production manufacturing process what are we looking for, what the costs are, and how might we move forward on that to make sure everything works in harmony. Part two is, what about the distribution system? So once the product is produced, how does it get to the truck? What are all the steps in the process? What are pipelines and terminals and jobbers and marketers and, and all the people in between? What are they doing to ensure product integrity? product quality, what practices are they employing, what challenges are they in encountering, and how are they overcoming them? During a discussion in May at the Fuels 2018 meeting, somebody raised the question, why don't we emulate jet fuel standards? Well, there are issues with jet fuel standards in terms of cost complexity and how much effort needs to go into this and what the return on that is. Clearly, take every precaution necessary to ensure jet fuel quality because the consequences for failure are considerable. What are the applications that can be employed in the distribution process for on-road diesel fuel, off-road diesel fuel, and what are the consequences for not doing that? What are the returns for doing so? And then ultimately, you know, let's talk about what we can do. At that time, we're going to share some of the results of the research we're doing right now and open up the discussion for a dialogue. What comes next? How do we move forward? How do we make sure that all pieces of this puzzle fit together to create a market that enables efficient truck movement throughout the country on an ongoing basis? Um, I think that type of workshop will result in very good understanding, much more 
appreciation for the complexity of other people within the other stakeholders within the transportation energy sector. One of the things I tell the Fuels Institute audience quite often is we can all be experts within our own little offices and our cubicles. But every once in a while you have to get out, walk around, talk to other people. And that's the only way you gain the perspective on what we can do next. And if we can come out of this workshop with some ideas of where we have the opportunity to really work together to make a positive improvement in the market, then the workshop itself will be a huge value to the market and give us a path forward. Um, which leads us to the last slide here and then we'll open it up and I'll see what, what kind of questions have been submitted. Um, there are opportunities. The only way to make this system work better is for everybody to work together. And so we encourage a lot of people on the webinar who are not currently engaged with the Fuel Institute and the Fuel Quality Council, there are opportunities. Get involved. You can participate in the survey. You can help us data collection. You can become a full-fledged partner in the uh, Fuel Quality Council, attend the workshop, communicate with us. So myself and Amanda are the ones kind of riding point on the Fuel Quality Council in this effort. We want your input. Whether you're part of the council or not a part of the council, we want to hear from you because only by listening to everybody that we possibly can, can we help the council figure out the best steps forward to provide meaningful uh, options for the market to move forward. And with that, Amanda, I'll ask you uh, if you've been monitoring questions and uh, I'll try to answer any questions that have been submitted. Yeah, and for those of you who may have joined late and missed it, if you have a question, please utilize the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions in there. Um, we got more of a, I guess it's more of a comment than a question, but uh, regarding fuel demand that EIA projections in 2020 and beyond are likely too low due to the IMO reduction in sulfur for marine fuels. Yeah, and you know, anytime you have a projection, uh, it's always going to be suspect and EIA's numbers are often uh, attacked by industry as not being reflective of current market realities. You know, that the government numbers are the the official numbers of the government, that's why I use them, because they give us a baseline. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with diesel demand with the sulfur reduction in maritime vessels. For those who aren't familiar with it, in January 2020, the sulfur content of marine going uh, fuels for marine going vessels is required to go down, or the vessels have to put on emission scrubbers, which none of them seem to be doing. So the demand for diesel fuel could spike. Uh, based upon an increased demand from the marine going uh, market, which is typically using a much heavier fuel that's not as uh, refined as on-road diesel fuel. So we could see an increase in that, which would be an interesting dynamic. And the Fuels Institute has a task group going to be looking at possible research we could do on that to help the market better understand and anticipate what could happen. <clears throat> but if we do see an increase in diesel demand, that's going to put some additional strain on the refineries to produce the fuel and if we start talking about changing specification, which might add more pressure to the, to the refineries to produce the fuel, the consequences. So keeping this global perspective, this broad view of the various factors that could be influenced in the market is very important because nothing happens in a vacuum. And one of the phrases I've always liked to use is the word just is probably the worst word in the English language. It, be, it betrays a lack of familiarity with the issue. It denigrates the efforts that different groups have to do. And really, other than a marketing ploy for Nike, should not be used. Nothing just happens. Anything that's going to happen is going to take planning, it's going to take investment, it's going to take coordination. And we need to be aware of that as we go forward. We also got a question when you were back on the corrosion slide. Who is doing the latest study? So I'm not sure if it was specifically regarding corrosion or something else. So the Coordinating Research Council is leading that study. I believe they contracted with Bechtel. I'd have to double check that, but I believe it's Bechtel doing the research for them. And they've identified, I think it's 11 primary characteristics of the fuel that they want to analyze for its relationship to uh, promoting corrosion in the underground storage tank to better understand where the major factors are that we can start focusing on to resolve it. Um, that study's been ongoing for quite a while, and uh, there's a really broad technical advisor group helping CRC coordinate that. Um, I am not very technical in nature, so I've not been paying that close attention to it, other than I'm quite confident that the individuals who are part of that advisor group know what they're doing. 
and uh, they've been guiding this process throughout. So I'm hopeful that we've spent a lot of money in the last 10 years analyzing corrosion of ultra low diesel. Uh, I'm really hopeful and optimistic that this project is going to provide some solid results that can help us chart a path forward. Is it going to solve it? No. But it's going to be another step forward to hopefully giving us some clues as to what we can do to mitigate corrosion going forward. You mentioned the consequences of the jet fuel industry versus regular diesel fuel. This is pretty easy to imagine, but are there any stats on the cost of fuel issues in the heavy truck industry? Obviously, human life is not as high, but the well, monetary cost has to be pretty big. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this engine performance survey. Um, we really want to quantify what the cost to the market is. So if the fleet operators are able to give us data on their maintenance logs, their downtime, lost hours of service that are consequences of poor fuel quality, that's going to be very instructive. Uh, you know, if it's, we're talking, if it's a million dollars to the market, maybe it's not worth, you know, going through all the efforts to address fuel quality. If it is 150, 200, 500 million dollars, um, you know, we don't know what the threshold is, but we don't know what the quantifiable cost is. So your point is very well taken. You know, I we use the jet fuel analogy because I've always said, you know, when a truck stops, it pulls over. When a plane stops, it drops. Very different scenario, but the cost to the market has to be understood. And so this survey that we're launching in a couple weeks is really designed to get to that number. Um, and clearly, you're not going to have any engine manufacturers say, we had you know, X number of dollars in warranty claims last year. They don't like people knowing that. We're hoping that through the confidential nature of our process, they're going to feel more comfortable sharing some of that information with us so that we can aggregate it. And keep in mind, if we can take all the information from all stakeholders and put it into a data set that allows us to analyze it, mix, combining OEM data with fleet manager data with retail customer complaint data, aggregating it together, we can really double, almost triple blind the sources and still get to the answer to the question, which is what's really happening and how much is it costing us? Then we can start doing the ROI on, is it worth getting into a specification discussion or a product handling discussion? It really puts some meat on the bones of the discussion we've been having. Will the Fuels Institute diagram out the places in the production slash distribution slash delivery chain where opportunities to negatively impact quality might occur, such We're as hoping. transfer points, filtration points, et cetera? We are hoping to. Our plan is to take a look at every product handling point in the process and identify, I'm, my first job is in the food industry, so HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. Where are the areas within the product distribution system that pose the greatest risk to product quality? And let's laser focus on those first and see if we can identify where the biggest risk to product quality exists and see if we can not mitigate that risk straight off the bat. But yeah, the whole idea is everybody within the product system has to be part of the solution, which means we have to analyze each part of the distribution system. So I want to understand um, what, the con what the potential for product quality degradation is when the product enters its first terminal to when it enters a pipeline, goes through a pipeline, drops in the next terminal, and it drops in through a loading rack into a truck, and it's dropped into a, a storage tank at a fuel dispensing station. All those elements need to be evaluated. We also need to get our arms around what is the benefit and the implications of various additives. We use additives at different stages of the distribution system for very important reasons, very, very high profile, very, very valuable reasons. But do we know exactly which additives are being added at which areas and how they all interact in the final product? We need to, we need to understand that a little bit better. And it's not that any of the additives present any challenge in and of themselves, but do we understand the overall composition of the fuel once we do these different things at different stages of the process? So really mapping out the entire distribution system to figure out the best course of action is a priority for us. All right, and I think, oh, did we get another question? We, we did. Have you reviewed any data associated with corrosion and a tank nitrogen system to arrest the bugs? 
I have not. Um, I'd be happy to take a look at something that came that way or actually probably give it to somebody a lot smarter than me to look at it and interpret it for me. Um, I'm confident that the uh, people who are running the study over at CRC have the broadest exposure and uh, experience in that area. I personally do not. Any other questions? All right. Oh, one more just came in. We have time for one more, John? Yeah, absolutely. What level of cooperation is the Institute expecting from the pipeline and other aspects of the distribution system? Great question. Expecting or hoping for? Um, <laughs> there may be two different issues. Uh, we're, we're reaching out to them. Uh, we really want them to be part of the solution. Um, they, there's different different levels of interest for all stakeholders. Um, so those are ongoing. It's a priority for the council to reach out to the pipelines and terminal operators um, to really engage them, at least in an informational area, even if they don't get, pers don't get officially involved in the council's work, but to get them to contribute data to provide perspective and make sure that they're part of the solution because we cannot do this with just part of the sector. Um, not one sector by itself can improve the situation. We all need to be working together. So we have good relationships with both the Association of Oil Pipelines and the international uh, terminal operators. So we'll be reaching out to them and talking to them and enlisting their support as much as we possibly can. What is our expected time of completion for the engine performance study? If we go in the market next month, in the next couple of weeks, uh, we're gonna be pretty aggressive in trying to solicit input. Um, I'm hoping to have the data done by the end of the year, um, but that's going to be contingent upon how much data we get. If the market is reluctant to submit data or slow to submit data, that's going to extend the timeline. But we're going to be enlisting the support of our council to reach out to their partners, their associates within the affected industries to encourage uh, participation. And if we get to a robust amount of data that we can then transfer over to NREL for analysis by the end of the year, that'd be my goal. Really want to get this accelerated and by the time we meet in February at the workshop, I'd love to have at least some preliminary data associated with the survey so that we can start making some progress going forward. But a lot of that, like I said, it's going to be contended upon the market being responsive and uh, uh, volunteering their data to help us move forward. If we get to the end of the year and we don't have any data, we don't have enough data, we can't align the data if we don't have enough contributors. So if we only have three contributors and we're going to have NDAs um, letting us know, letting our research now SSI know how many people, how many companies are submitting data, we need to make sure we have a robust set of data. That's the only way to ensure uh, the confidentiality of our participants. Any other questions? All right. Well, with that, we just wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope that you found the information valuable. And if you have any questions that we didn't get to answer today, please feel free to follow up with us um, on email directly so that way we can answer those for you. And thanks again. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, thanks, guys. Talk to you soon.